Open your Bibles this morning to Psalms 142. Before we read this psalm, I want to chat with you for just a little while. You know, I'm, I'm certain there are a lot of people that wonder why preachers spend so much time studying. Probably some <laughs> preachers' wives that wonder, well, why do you have to study so much? And, uh, you know, after a while, they get, did I hear something? <laughs> uh, maybe that was anticipation. <laughs> after a while, they generally figure it out, though, but... Believe it or not, I, I really, I get it. That's a fair question. So I want to give you a short and an honest answer. And um, I would respond like this. You know, there's more to it, preaching, than just the content of the message. I mean, that's important. What to preach, the content. And uh, let me tell you right now, we can't figure that out without God's help because you know, it doesn't make any difference what I want to say. It's what God wants me to say. That's what really matters most. But there's more to it than just the content. There's the matter of correctness. We have to, you know, properly interpret the Word of God and explain the Word of God, uh, make sure we're preaching the truth. But there's also the matter of presentation. And I mention this because... This last week, I spent several hours working on a particular message, and uh, and all of a sudden, uh, just in a heartbeat, it's like the Lord was was leading me to do something entirely different and take a different approach. If you know me, you know I'm a big fan of outlines. You know, an outline, you know, gives you a lot of uh, uh, it's 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 like a, a peg to hang your hat on, you know. So you remember where it's at. And so I'm a big fan of outlines. I'm a big fan of alliteration. Anything to help it easy for people to remember the message. But sometimes an outline on certain messages, I believe, can actually distract from the subject. I think sometimes it's better just to be conversational rather than taking a formal approach and, you know, with all of the facts neatly arranged in a package of, of an outline for people. And I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I just want to talk to you today instead of trying to preach at you. And, and I say that because uh, of the content of this uh, of this particular psalm. There's just one point that I want to focus on. But we have to do it within the context of the entire psalm. I could talk about David's danger, his desperation, his depression as a result of that, his discernment and knowing where to go with his problem, and finally his deliverance. And instead of doing that, I want you to just, you know, just pull up a chair and listen to what's on my heart. And I'm going to read this psalm and then we'll get to the text. David says, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before Him. I showed before Him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then Thou knewest my path. In the way wherein I walked, have they privately led a snare, laid a snare for me. I looked on my right hand and, and beheld but there was no man that would know me. Refuge fail me. No man cared for my soul. I cried unto thee, O Lord, and I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Attend unto my cry, for I am brought low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. I uh, originally had planned to preach this morning on the subject of love. And the thing that, that God used to change my mind was the thought that before we do that, we need to, I think, address the issue concerning those who, who feel the, the lack of it and those who sense the need for it. 
you, you know, I'm doing this because most people don't see the need for loving other people until they first sense the need for being loved themselves. And so here in this story, in this situation that David finds himself in, we find a man that has at least come to the conclusion momentarily that in this situation that there is nobody that cares Nobody that is standing with him, that he is all alone, he is deserted, and here he is hiding in the cave from Saul who's trying to kill him. And when you look at the whole story, it'd make a great plot for a movie. And I've even got a title for that movie. It would be Trapped. David feels trapped. When I was a boy, I loved to explore caves. But I never wanted to be trapped in one, I can guarantee you that. Caves can be dangerous places, and uh, it might be that that's not your thing. You, you know, you don't, you don't want to go into a cave. And, uh, but eventually, let me tell you, you're going to find yourself in a cave of some sort. Might not be dark, might not be cold, might not be damp. But you'll find yourself in a cave of circumstances that is in a situation where there seems to be no way out. In fact, it just might be there's someone here this morning that's in a place right now. And compounding that problem is your feeling that nobody really cares. You feel frightened. You feel like you've been deserted, that you're all alone, that there's no one there to help you. Notice verse number four, though this one comment is the text for the message where David said, no man cared for my soul. Now, as I said, we in preaching or teaching, we always have to consider the context when you're reading your Bible. It's crucial that you consider the context or you're going to end up with the wrong conclusion. And so that's very easy to do in this situation because we find the picture here of David in this damp, dark cave hiding from Saul, King Saul, who is trying to kill him. If I remember right, he had 3,000 soldiers with him, searching for him, trying to kill him. And now David feels there's no one here to help me. Now, we don't know that that is exactly true. I'm telling you how he felt because David did have a few hundred faithful followers. I don't know whether they were in the cave with him or not. That really doesn't matter. At this point, he feels threatened. He feels afraid. He feels like he's trapped and there's nobody there to help him. And, you know, look, it's our nature that we want other people to like us. Really, I don't know of anybody that just really goes through life thinking, I wish everybody would just hate me. I don't want anybody to like me. We all want people to like us. And we all want people to help us during a time of need. The problem is, as you probably know, not everybody will. Because not everybody cares. And a lot of times we get too overly concerned about who cares and who doesn't care. And that can lead, in some situations, that feeling can lead to more harm being done than the harm that's being done by the person that doesn't care enough to help you. Are you listening? What I'm saying is you can do to yourself more harm than what the other person is doing to you because of the fact that they don't care and you are troubled by that very fact. It can cause a lot of bad things to happen. Let me just give you three real quick. I mean, we can make a, a list of a dozen, no doubt. But the three things that come to my mind when we get to the place where David found himself that nobody cares for me, number one, it can cause us to not care about those who don't care. You know, if you don't care about me, I don't care about you. In other words, we're returning evil for evil. Look, we've got a responsibility to care for others whether they care for us or not. 
But but we are tempted in a situation like that to return evil for evil. We, we, you know, we stoop down to their level. We start playing their game. You know, they don't like us. They don't care for us. So we'll just do the same thing to them. Secondly, it can cause us to get bitter so that we lose our joy, we lose our peace. And, um, you know, we get so disturbed about people that don't care that we forget about the people that do care. And one of the, one of the things that when I think about the Apostle Paul and all the difficulties that he went through, I don't know of anyone after Christ that was so godly, so spiritual, so dedicated to the will of God as the Apostle Paul was. And yet at the same time, I don't know of anyone that had more enemies, that faced more difficulties than the Apostle Paul did. It would have been very easy for him to say, look, there's just too much opposition. I'm tired of the struggle. I'm tired of these difficulties. I've had it. You know, I'm going to move out here on a mountain somewhere far away where nobody will bother me. It would be real easy for him to to just give up, but he didn't. And the thing about it, with all of those people against him, the one thing Paul never did, he never forgot about his friends. And if you'll read his letters, you'll find that in every instance, again and again and again, he, he, he mentions them by name. Some of them, you know, we, we've never heard of before. We don't know anything about them. But the Holy Spirit led Paul to include their name for some reason. And so Paul never forgot about those who were for him because of being irritated about those who were against him. Are you with me? If you're not careful... When you get to that place in life that you are in a cave of circumstances and everything seems to be against you, that nobody cares for you, you'll get so perturbed about that, you'll forget about those who are for you, those that do love you and care about you. But there's another danger. The other danger is whenever we get into this situation as David found himself in, it can cause us to misjudge other people. Look, just because somebody doesn't live up to our expectations doesn't mean they don't care. You know, so many times that we we think that we know what other person ought, ought, ought to be doing. We're experts, you know, at that, right? Well, so-and-so ought to be doing this, and so-and-so ought to be doing that. And the fact of the matter is, we don't know all of the facts. Things are not always as they seem to be. There are things behind the scenes that we don't know anything about. And, and even though we think we've got it figured out, we really don't have a clue. And it's a real eye-opener when suddenly that we realize that we can't even trust our judgment about a person. You know, we just presume. Let me tell you, age and adversity have a way of teaching us things that we would have never known without them. Age and adversity. In other words, going through the school of hard knocks and the experiences of life. And I, I can't tell you the number of times that I've had to, had to apologize. I had to repent and apologize for presuming something. It's so easy. We presume so and so, you know, they said this, but we presume they meant that. We, you know, we just presume that they didn't care, but we don't know the details. And they're not always at liberty to explain to us everything that's going on so we will understand. Why should they? If we really love one another and someone simply says, I can't, why is it that they have to give an explanation for you know all of the reasons why they can't do what you want them to do? So I'm saying to you that when we get in a situation like David is in, and don't think for a moment that it can't happen to you because it can happen to all of us. He said, "My spirit," he said, "My spirit was overwhelmed within." Now you put yourself in David's place. You think about being in this situation. I, I, I know we, we think about David being there and, and hiding from Saul and, and automatically we just assume, well, he's being overly dramatic. You know, no man cared for my soul. Well, 
We all know that's not absolutely 100% true. And I really think if somebody had tapped him on the shoulder and said, wait, wait, wait a minute, David, uh, I, I, you know, I don't think you've thought this through, David would admit, well, yeah, that is a bit of an exaggeration. You see what I'm saying? It's so easy for us to come to conclusions based on how we feel about the situation that we're in. Fortunately, David didn't continue that line of thought because he quickly turned his attention to God. If you read verse 5, 6, and 7, you'll notice. You know, it's one thing for your spirit to be overwhelmed within you. That is to be knocked off of your spiritual equilibrium. It's another thing to live that way habitually. And let me tell you, this ought to serve as a reminder to all of us because, you know, a lot of times we assume that people don't care when they really do. And, and, and we've got to get to the place that we stop caring so much about whether people care or not. Right? Because we can't let each other determine our happiness. Now, certainly whenever something good happens, why we rejoice in that. But, but if you just get focused on you know, the badness of someone else, it'll destroy all of the goodness within you. So we just have to come to the conclusion that I cannot let their failure cause my fall. And it happens all of the time. As I wrote in Morning Man of this morning about the fact, I, I believe it was that one, maybe I haven't even sent it out yet, but about those, you know, that just which I haven't, I'm getting ahead of myself, it'll come out in a day or two, those that say, you know, well, I've had it with church, I'm going to quit going, there's too many hypocrites in the church. And sometimes we assume that that could never happen to us. Don't you kid yourself, it can happen to you, me, or anyone else. You're not as strong as you think you are. Here is David, and we, what, um, think about it, what if this is all we knew about David. Now, I mean, this is all the information. We would think, well, my, he is just a weakling. He's overly dramatic. I mean, he, all he, he just wanting sympathy that he, he, we'd forget about the fact that this man is a giant killer. <laughs> this man is a man after God's own heart. This is a man that God has chosen. But we look at that one little part of his life and he says, my spirit was overwhelmed within me. Now, the good news is, regardless of whatever your situation is, there is someone who cares. Like the old song says, no one ever cared for me like Jesus. Boy, that's nothing, that never been more true than that. That's why Peter said, casting all of your cares upon the Lord, for He careth for you. And let me tell you, if you're not crying out to God as David did, if you're not caring for others, then don't complain about others not caring about you. Think about it. Because it's so easy for us to just handpick those that... You know, that for whatever reason, they have, they have offended us. And we allow our attention to be diverted over to that offense. A genuine offense, perhaps. And we keep dwelling on that. And it's like a sore that just festers up. And all of a sudden, there's the eruption. And what? We are emotionally overwhelmed, just like David was. And we've got to get beyond that. We've got to get to the place in our life that we realize that if the whole world is against me, God is for me. Amen. Now here's one of the dangers. When we get in a situation like that, we get to thinking that if others don't care about me, why should I even care about myself? In other words, they just give up. You know, we just kind of curl up in a fetal position in a corner somewhere and cry ourselves to sleep. And if others don't care about me, why should I care about myself? 
Let me tell you why. Because you are responsible for you and for nobody else. Nobody, they've got to answer to God for their offenses. And you have to answer for God how you respond to those offenses. In this story, we see a lesson for the lonely, you could say. And let me tell you, sometimes, believe this or not, sometimes it's good for us to feel deserted, neglected, and alone, and so forth, just like David felt. Sometimes it's good. Why? Because of the fact that it causes us to turn to God. That, that's why, you know, the Lord said all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. He didn't say all the good things work together for good, but He said all things, bad things, good things, everything works together for good. And sometimes the very worst things that can happen to us are in reality the best things for us because they awaken us to our need of God. And if all was sunshine and roses... There are those that would never get serious about their relationship with God. You see, there are a lot of lessons that we can learn in the caves of life. In those circumstances to where, to where we're overwhelmed just like David. We look at this psalm and we start taking it apart. In the first two verses we see David's plea and then he explains his plight in verse 3 and 4. He speaks of his portion, that is the Lord, in verse 5 and 6. And all of that ends up in praise. What started out in pain ends up in praise to God. Why? Because it made him realize his great need for God. If, if you're longing for someone to care, I, I'm, I'm happy to tell you there is someone that cares. There's somebody that cares about you. Just because you feel no one cares doesn't mean you're not cared for. His eye is on the sparrow and he watches over me and he watches over you. I don't know what kind of a cave that you might be in today. It might be that some of you are in, your marriage is in shambles and you've reached an, an impasse at trying to resolve your differences. It, it, it's come to the place that there seems to be no hope for reconciliation. That's the cave of your particular circumstance. For others, it might be a dead-end job. Again and again, you've been passed up for the promotion that you, that you deserve and your bills are, are higher than your income and you don't know what you're going to do, but you're just stuck there. You don't know where to turn. You don't know what to do. It might be that your cave is a nursing home. Someone can find to a nursing home. Bev and I was talking the other day about a situation and uh, something was on television and pictures of people living in the third world country and think about the difficulties there of teeming millions of people living in, in extreme poverty, cramped up together. There's no sitting on the back porch with a glass of tea and relaxing and being alone with just your loved ones. It, it's just helder skelder all the time. And we were talking about, you know, how wonderful, how blessed we are to live as we do. But listen, folks, you don't have to be in a third world country somewhere to experience that kind of desperation. It just might be that someday you'll end up in a nursing home forsaken by your family and your friends you say, well, it'll never happen to me. Well, don't kid yourself. You have no idea what might happen to you. I'm just telling you, you might be there. And at that time, you're going to feel like David. My spirit is overwhelmed within me. How does God expect me to live within the, the walls of this uncomfortable, smelly, stinking nursing home with, without good food and friends and loved ones? And right now, there are millions of people across America in that cave. For others, it might be that the diagnosis has come back from your doctor. It's stage four. 
and there's not anything else that we can do. We've double-checked. We've run all of the tests. We've come to the conclusion it's stage four. We've tried all of the treatments. And whenever you hear that, all of a sudden your spirit is overwhelmed within you. And that's why it's so very important that we understand, just as David explains to us here, notice it was immediately after expressing his pain, notice verse 5, I cried unto thee, O Lord. I mean, that was the very first thing and the most important thing he did. Rather than just sitting back, look, he could have written chapter after chapter after chapter about that situation. He could have named names. No man cared for my soul. Let me tell you who they are. Let me tell you what they've done. And he could have just stayed so hung up on that, he would forget about what he had. What did he have? He said, the Lord's my portion. If the Lord's your portion, you can do without whatever it is they're withholding from you, because if you have God, you have all you need. And it might be today that that you're here and you feel trapped. You're in this situation. There's no escape. It's all doom. It's all gloom. And the only way out is going to be death. And you really don't feel ready for that, maybe. So how are you supposed to keep going? What in the world are you supposed to do? You've heard all of the sermons. You could quote one verse after another related to your particular problem. All of the odds are against you. And like David, you're in this damp, dark cave of circumstances. There's no help in sight. Well, the good news is there's someone who cares. And that someone is Jesus Whether your need is salvation, whether your need is restoration, whether your need is an infusion of 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 joy and peace, whatever your need is, Jesus is the answer. He's the solution. Don't you dare throw up your hands in despair and say, well, I might as well just give up because I'm trapped in this cave and nobody seems to care about my situation. Yes, Jesus cares. Jesus cares. And if you'll bring if you'll bring your problems and lay them at his feet, this is exactly what David is doing. He said, I looked on my right hand and beheld that and there was no man there. No no one that would know me, and refuge fail me, no man cared for my soul. I cried unto the Lord, Thou art my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. And then notice his plea. He says, Attend unto my cry. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. In other words, my problem, my problem is stronger than I am. Bring my soul out of prison. And I want you to notice the reason now. That I may praise thy name. Boy, I'll tell you, whenever we put it to God like that, Lord, heal my body. Lord, restore my spirit. Lord, mend my relationships. Lord, meet my needs. And then we conclude that request with saying, Lord, the only reason I want you to do it is so you'll be glorified, so I can praise your holy name, so that others can see your greatness in what you've done for me. When we put it like that, all of a sudden... All of a sudden, all of a sudden, God is more than just concerned about our problem. God comes to our aid. Amen? Amen. You see, God is here. And God hears our cry. And God can help. Wouldn't it be horrible if we talk about this omniscient God? He knows everything, and He's omnipotent. He can do everything. But He's just really kind of busy today. He doesn't have time to, to really be of any help. I, I, I'm glad to tell you He's not a God like that. He is a God who cares. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. And He cares for you too. I want you to leave here today regardless of your circumstances saying, Thank God I've been reminded there is someone 
who cares. It's someone who cares. I want to do something different today. I ask Lisa before the service to sing the invitation this morning. I want everyone to stand. She's going to come. And I want you to listen to the words of this old song because I can almost guarantee you there are times, listen carefully to what I say, there are times not only do you feel like there's no one that cares about me, but it's possible sometimes for us to get to the point that we feel that even God has forsaken us. I can show you verse after verse, the psalmist and Job and others that literally come out and said, Lord, why are you treating me like, like I'm an enemy? In other words, they're saying, Lord, this isn't fair. I don't understand this. Why don't you care? And the fact of the matter is, He really does care about you. But we have to come to Him on His terms and that is to seek His glory and to trust Him. You see, it honors God for us to put our faith in Him. That's what God wants you to do this morning. You're never going to be able to figure out why this happened and why it happened now. You'll never figure it out. But you can trust God whenever you cannot trace His hand and what He's doing. You can always trust His heart and to know that He doesn't make any mistakes. Father in heaven, we pray you will bless your word this morning. I pray, Heavenly Father, this morning that you'll get someone out of that cave of misery today. Deliver them, Heavenly Father. Bring them out and be glorified in everything that happens. And if somebody is here that has just basically given up on life, God, I pray you'll restore them today that they'll leave here with joy in their heart. In Jesus' name. While Lisa sings and you think about the words of this song, if God's speaking to your heart, would you come?
song it's the truth i'll never forget many 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 years ago hearing governor jimmy davis sang that and uh, 